topics in different application domains. Uh, people have started complaining at, or started pretty <coughs> concerned on the quality on data sets, the fact that the data set might be biased, the fact that the process itself might be biased, how you build the data set might have unconscious bias into it. And therefore, all the results that you have might not be actually trusted or trustworthy as we would like them to be. So let me just try to see, uh, to try to convince you a little bit more in why we haven't really been doing machine learning uh, rightfully in security context. And, you know, I'm actually an advocate of machine learning, so I'm not trying to, to discourage you guys uh, from applying machine learning. But I believe that we need to really understand what is the application domain that we apply in this technique. And if we borrow something from another discipline, that's fine. This is what research is about. But we need to understand what are the assumptions that we work within. Because otherwise, everything might fall apart. And uh, as research as scientists, it's good to know if things fall apart. But we need to understand when they, and what are the implications, and what can we do afterwards, because otherwise it's a game over. So if we actually look at the traditional machine learning pipeline, and by the way, if you just read papers, even publish in top tier conferences, and my, I'm a system security researcher, so of course you know I, I focus on, on system security related uh, conferences, and if you look at the top four, is using security, and assess, ACM, CCS, attribute security and privacy, well-known apps like Kuga, <coughs> Solarix, uh, uh, Asia, CCS, and so forth and so on. So, but even if you look at those conferences, and if you try to understand how people have used machine learning in this context, they've been relying on classification tasks, they've been performing un uh, unsupervised learning, so a lot of clustering, and lately, because it's becoming cool, you have to use deep learning, otherwise uh, people complain. So my, my little piece of advice, don't use deep learning because otherwise people complain, use deep learning, if it's necessary to use deep learning, okay? Um, so even if you use uh, machine learning in this context for classifi classifying uh, malicious threats, uh, finding vulnerabilities, or clustering objects that are looking alike, you can see that all these papers, more or less, they boast very high performances. If you look at a typical metric to measure the performances in this context, F1 score, you can see that now everyone is, is claiming 99% of F1 score, or close to, right? So the point is, if this is true, if we actually got to 99% F1 score uh, in specific application uh, domain and in specific tasks, for instance, uh, <coughs> say you know that you're interested in classifying malicious software, and you can classify with 99% of F1 score, which is a harmonized mean of precision and recall, Again, if F1 score is not the metric that you're interested in, go for precision or recall, whatever you're interested in, it's not important for the conversation. But if that really is the result, well, the problem is pretty much solved. So 99% is actually a very good result, especially because that outperforms human beings in, in similar tasks. Even if you consider image classification, now machines can outperform um, human beings in this task. There are a bunch of issues that I'll try to come up with at the very end of the talk. Uh, in this context, but this is kind of the gist, okay? So if the result is true, then we can focus on other simple tasks. Now the question is, is there any bias in the way that we apply machine learning in this context? And bias in this case, I know there is a bit of an overloaded ter term, so uh, it could be unconscious bias, like you know, whether the algorithm is fair or not. But in this case, I'm actually referring to experimental bias. So is there anything that you do when you try to evaluate these systems that might affect actually the actual performance of the system itself. And what I'm saying is that people haven't done this on purpose. It's just something that happened because we haven't probably put too much thought into the assumptions that are required when we operate in this context, in security context. And I'll try to, you know, to convince you uh, of what I'm just claiming through a set of uh, experiments. But let me just first uh, revise a little bit the a typical machine learning pipeline. And again, I'm, I'm focused on security, uh, sorry, I'm focusing on classification tasks. And for simplicity, let's look at uh, the two class classification problems. So a binary classification problem. And for simplicity, let's say, you know, malware and goodware. So you're interested in feeding your, in training your algorithm, whatever algorithm it is, with a corpus of benign and malicious software. And at the end of the day, you want the system to predict whether something that was unseen before is either benign or Okay, typical class, typical um, setting. So first we have um, 
will come up with an idea, and we decide, okay, I believe that we might actually solve that with this algorithm. And so the focus really is not on the algorithm itself, so you can think about anything that you are familiar with. It could be an SVM. Of course, you know, at the very beginning, it's, it's good to try with very simple classifiers. So you can try with a linear classifier, SVM. You can try with something a bit more sophisticated or random forest, and then eventually venturing and deep learning if you feel like you know that's what you need. But I'll come back to that point a uh, again on the talk. Of course, you know what it is important that we <coughs> often neglect here is that there is an extra step that we need to perform when you do apply machine learning on non-natural <coughs> data. So if you have a piece of software, you cannot just feed the binary blob into the machine learning algorithm. You can. If you have a deep learning algorithm, you can just take whatever it is, you can interpret it as, as a sequence of one and zero, put it into the classifier, and hoping like stir and hoping that something good happens. But there's very little understanding on, on why this happens, and there's very little, or there is a very high chance that the classifier picks up artifacts that are in the binary. Because you're just treating the binary as, as a blob of data without interpreting it. Now, if you think for a second about how deep learning works on image classification slightly, <coughs> because the input space, so the image, the object that you want to classify, and the feature space, so the representation of the object is the same. So, so whatever deep learning, a convolutional neural network does, is basically to look at every bit within the image in a different way to capture through different layers different properties of the image. Now when you have a piece of software, we have to do something more. So there is a representation or an abstraction that we need to um, decide to use to represent this piece of software. Okay. Uh, it could be that we can employ a very lightweight static analysis whereby we just compute the statistics of the byte frequencies that we find into the binary. Is it good or bad? I don't know, but it's a possible way to do it. Another way is that we might build a counter flow graph to try to represent all the possible execution of the program. Is it good or not? Well, it depends on the task. There are challenges in building the counter flow graph, but of course, you know, it's a different representation that tries to capture a different execution path of the binary program. We can build a data dependency graph, which captures not only execution path, but dependencies between data that is uh, involved in the computation of the program, and so forth and so on. So there are a bunch of different abstractions we can decide to use. And those influence the task at hand, because those are the abstraction that we use to create a feature space that represents an object. Okay, So if I have uh, a glass, I can use just one feature to represent it, and you can say, this is a glass, it's made of glass, and then the feature would be one if it's made of glass, or zero if it's a plastic glass, okay? That is an abstraction. Is it a good one? <coughs> I don't know. It depends on the task. Sometimes you might have issues if you have not meaningful features, of course. So the same things happen here, but I believe that we never really thought too much about these abstractions. But anyway, <coughs> let's say that you, know, you pick your algorithm, and you find that you come up with an abstraction that you're happy about to represent your software. Okay? Okay, sequences of system calls that are involved, sequences of APIs that are involved, depending on the, on the domain, if it's on Android, sequences of permissions that are invoked, and so forth and so on. Okay? Then what you do, um, well, once you decide that you, know, you could actually perform this, this task, you need to collect a data set. Of course, you know, these two steps can be in the change, so you might actually say, oh, I want to work on this specific task, you collect the data set first, and then you look at the data set, you look at the object, and then you try to come up with an abstraction that is useful for your task. <coughs> and of course, you know, we're focusing on malware detection, and we're focusing on a binary <coughs> classification task, um, so we need to collect malicious objects as well as benign objects. And, you know, uh, so far, if you look in the literature, it's, it's been quite unclear on what is the size of the data set that you need to uh, collect. Uh, it's quite clear, so people have reached a sort of a consensus that it's like a, in the order of a thousand, now it's not really representative of, of a real life domain application. So if it's in the order of a tens of a thousand, then it's a bit better because you can draw statistically sound conclusions, okay? Uh, now say that you collect 50,000 malware and then collect uh, 10,000 free Google, uh, free application from uh, Google Play. And the malware comes from all different sort of uh, data set sources. By the way, uh, if you have any questions, you can interrupt me any time, so don't wait till the end. Okay? So contextualization is very important, and I don't mind. Actually, I quite like it. 
So um, then say that, you know, of course, you know, if there is something completely novel that nobody has ever done it, then you are in a good spot and probably you are after a sort of a low hanging fruit and it's actually pretty good. But in specific domains, such as malware classification, and again, if you focus on Android malware classification, because we mentioned Google Play, so the research landscape is quite crowded, okay? So there is a state of the art that you need to compare yourself against, okay? And of course, you know, what you do, you just uh, implement your approach, you design your experiments, once you've done all the features, all the other steps, and then you have to evaluate it, right? And how you evaluate it, of course, you try to do things in the correct way, so you have some familiarity with machine learning, so you sort of borrow best practices, and say, well, I know that to try to avoid any bias and any luck in the way that I partition my data set, then I try to evaluate with k cross-validation. Okay. And k cross-validation, so first you need to have a training data set and a testing data set. Training data set is the one that you optimize your classifier, so you train your classifier. Usually it involves in minimizing the cost function, um, a loss function. And then you <coughs> test your classifier. And for testing your classifier, you have to use a data set that has completely been untouched, so that you haven't used to train your classifier, otherwise you're cheating, right? Uh, and a typical way that you can evaluate your classifier in the settings is with k-fold cross-validation. K-fold cross-validation requires that you take your whole data set, you partition it in k-folds, or before size, and you train the classifier <laughs> on k minus one fold that are randomly selected. You test on the k, <coughs> and then you repeat this process k time. So the idea is actually every point in the data set is used as a training object and as a test <coughs> object, just not at the same time. So the idea is actually you try to avoid uh, a lucky split for which it was particularly lucky and the, the classifier performed pretty well on that split of training and testing data set. So you repeat this process randomly k times and you sort of you know, try to minimize the problem of overfitting the data. And you all average the results. And that is usually what people most of the times have done is either k-fold cross-validation or whole data validation that is repeated a few times, which basically if you don't have a very big data set, um, you can split in training and testing and repeat this a few times. Um, which is fine, and then you have your number and you do the k-fold cross-validation, and at that point you can compare the results. So, so if the state of the art says you know, that they perform uh, uh, 0 0.97 and another one 0 0.88, 86, and then your approach performs 0 0.99, then you, know, you have a valid point to, to say that at least uh, in terms of detection accuracy, your approach is better than the other. It's all good, right? So I'm sorry you have to come here now so we can all leave. Okay. But it's not quite the end of the story because remember that I mentioned something about assumptions, right? What is the assumption that we are using here? Can anybody take a guess? So there's just at least one assumption that we are assuming that it holds, but in reality we don't know, and in practice it doesn't, eventually. Yes? Do we know the exact features of malware? That is fine, we know the features of the malware, but that is fine. So let's assume that we, we want to represent objects, so programs, in a specific way. So, and we have a labeled data set that we train the classifier with, and then of course you know, we have to represent goodware and, and malware using the same abstraction. So say that, that I use a sequence of system calls, uh, that I find in the program, and I do that for malware and goodware. And those represent points in, a, in an n-dimensional space, and then I hope that I can you know, divide these, these classes. Okay? So that is fine. There's another assumption that we have. Put one there, yes? Kind of. I believe that, you know, the, the point, yes, there's another there. Interesting, and I believe, so let me try to paraphrase what you guys mentioned now. Uh, so, I'm sure that you heard in a <coughs> basic class, and probability about IIT. So, Algorithm. Say it again, sorry? Algorithm. Algorithm. I'm not sure I get that. But, so I, what I was trying to refer to is uh, the IID assumption, so that the data set has to be independent and identically distributed. So it means this IID is always right everywhere, IID, IID, IID. So we never think about it. But it means that objects that you find in the data set should be independent, so there shouldn't be any relationship between each other. And uh, they should be identically distributed. It means that 
object that belongs to the training data set and the testing data set should be drawn from the same probability distribution. If we don't know, but that's fine. As long as they're drawn from the same distribution, then we can do this reasoning because it's about statistics, right? And that is fine. So the problem is that, or the question is, do we work under IID assumptions here? Well, the problem is that in security, we work under non stationarity So you have an object, a malware, and eventually that malware evolves over time. The behavior of that malware changes over time. There are new malware, new threat that come in, comes in. And those might be completely, so if you think about distribution, they might actually be drawn from distributions that are completely unrelated to the one that you used to train your classifier. So in reality, once you deploy your classifier, you will be able to detect malware as they are not drifting from the distribution, but eventually they will start drifting off from the distribution. And you start observing what is known as constant drift, or depending on the community, you might call it data set shift, for instance. So, and therefore, if you just perform a k-fold cross-validation, um, well, you're just giving a snapshot of the performance of the <coughs> classifier in the absence of constant drift. But you don't know for how long that will hold and how serious it is in your specific domain. If it's not a problem, then it's fine. But if it is a problem, then you need to be aware on how quickly the performance of the classifier is over time, and how can you do, and what can you do actually try to boost it up again. So that's the first uh, uh, assumption. So the first assumption is that the capable cross validation, uh, so we're assuming that we're working in a stationary context. So to go back to your point is that if the data set that we have here is representative of the whole population and the population would never change, then it's fine. So we'll partition, we'll do capable cross, we'll do hold down, we'll do whatever we want to the usual best practice, and that is fine. But if that data set is not representative, and it cannot be representative of the population because it, it's only representative of the population at a specific point in time, after which things will change. We don't know when. So there are algorithms to detect change point detection to detect when this changes, for instance, but we don't know when and we don't know how serious this affects a specific security domain. Okay? So different security application domains have different problems with concentration, but there is, it's quite endemic. So we've been having a conversation with people at Facebook and Google, and of course they say, you know, they have concept drift issues across the whole pipeline. Now, depending on the specific domain or task that you want to solve, it could be quick, it could be slower, it could be serious, it could be less serious, so it really depends. So we need to really understand how does that affect in, gen so in general, okay? So it's an endemic problem, but the consequences are specific to a targeted uh, application domain. So that's the first one. And the second, and the other, um, assumptions revolve around the fact of how you build your data set. Okay? Because you have to pay you have to pay attention on how you compose the data set because otherwise you might introduce bias in the composition of the data set. And bias might actually result in inflated uh, so might actually um, influence the classified performance and produce inflated results. And I try to convince you and to show you why. So, the first, uh, the first experimental bias that we identified. Yes. I was just going to ask if, as new malware kind of evolves and comes in, if you keep training your model on that new malware and it performs better on that, that's, would, would it perform worse on the older stuff? That's a very interesting question, and it's a kind of an open research question. So there's no simple answer. I'll try to answer to that question at the end. Uh, but the idea is <coughs> there's always a trade-off in computational resources that can devote to a problem. So you can actually do incremental retraining, so we'll see later on, but you know, if you keep on seeing things coming in, then you can keep on incrementally retraining your classifier. But the question is, do you use your whole data set or you have a sort of a sliding window? There are practical, uh, practical um, trade-offs that you have to consider. So first is storage capacity. Second, computational capacity, because most of the so more points you have, the more time you take to train a classifier. And also, not all the points are, are alike. Some points are better suited to, to define the shape of the, of the decision boundaries, and other points, no. But they provide statistical support for a decision. So it depends on what you do with a classifier. Now, if you have a sliding window, of course, you, know, you might have this performance decay that we'll see in a second, also in the past. Because you imagine that you have a performance here, and then you decay over time. And then you keep on retraining, so you sort of shift this a little bit, but then you start losing on this side. Now, is that a problem? 
I'll try to come up with this point with a graph, don't worry. Uh, is that a problem? Uh, it really depends whether the past can still happen in this timeline. So whether objects that I trained in the past are still an issue, are still a threat in this time frame. Okay? If they are not, say there is a new API, there are deprecated API that are no longer supported, and, and the malware or whatever it is that you're focusing on cannot really simply run because you don't have the runtime support for it. So yes, you have constant drift in the past, but you don't care because it's no longer an actual threat. Okay? So it's very delicate, so there's no straight answer. It depends on the problem. It may happen that uh, uh, if you keep training your model, your performance decreases. Yes. Right. Yes. So it can also happen that. So it's not easy. So incremental retraining is not the solution. You're absolutely right. So the sliding window is not always a good idea. It's not always a good idea. It's not always a good idea to use all the points. Uh, I'll try to give some, some uh, perspective at the very end that we've experimented also a little bit with active learning. So I'm sorry, I'm just fast forwarding a little bit to understand whether we can find good points that we can use to change the shape of the, binary, of the decision boundary. Anyway, so if you haven't followed completely here, it just doesn't matter, so we'll just recap it at the very end. Um, so it's clear that we have these issues because we work in a non-stationarity context, and therefore IID, uh, the IID assumptions, eventually doesn't hold anymore. Now, we have to understand how serious this is and whether it's a problem, what can we do about it? But also we have to be careful uh, because on how we compose the data set because IID is one of the problem, but then also if we are working with a randomly selected data set, we might actually introduce some bias that I'll try to outline in a second that might inflate the result. So um, the first one relates to IID, what I just mentioned. So imagine that you have now your data set, and instead of considering like, you know, as a whole, and then you use K-fold cross-validation, and we chop it up in different folds, and then we train and test, as I mentioned before. Imagine that you just <coughs> roll out your data set on a timeline. So every object has a timestamp that tells you when the object was either first created, or first seen, or things like that, okay? Or when the first infection, the first installation, and things like that. Um, now you can see that these objects, so let's say, you know, the one with the real, uh, the benign, of course, and then the, the ugly one, the angry one, are the malicious software. And let's see that, you know, they all scatter throughout the timeline, okay? Pretty much uniformly. So it doesn't have to be completely uniform, uniformly uh, uh, distributed, but it has to respect a real life scenario, okay? And this is, again, opens up the question for how can we ensure that? And it's unclear how we can ensure it. Uh, um, but it's clear that we need more measurement studies to understand this phenomenon, okay? So let's say that these ones that are a bit shader, uh, like it's a pale <coughs> red, are the new type of malware, okay? And now, when you do perform a K-fold cross validation, so you shuffle things around, and then you, you divide it in, in folds. That for simplicity now, let's say that I've just used uh, uh, two folds. You know, so one training and one testing, okay? Just for simplicity. In this case, can you, you see that you have here, um, so on the left-hand side, in the training data set, you have a bit of everything, so you have a bit of malicious software, a bit of benign software, and this is good. But if you can see more carefully, you have a couple of uh, pale red uh, malware that they were very far away in the timeline. So they were the new threats, right? <coughs> but we're using this knowledge to train the classifier. And here on the testing, we also have something in the future and also something in the past. But once you deploy the classifier, you can only train up until what you have to that point. So you cannot just uh, train with data that you might see in the future because you don't have it. And as long as you cannot really predict how the distribution might look like, you can just do it. So again, a cable consolidation is a good evaluation uh, methodology. So I'm not advocating for not doing it. We have to do it to try to avoid overfitting. But what we can <coughs> what we can achieve is just an approximation of how the classifier will perform in the absence of concentrate. So in a situation where we don't care about new threats because we're reasoning about stationarity. So we're reasoning about things that do not evolve over time. In that case, it's good. But otherwise, we're using knowledge from the future to train the classifier, which in real life, we cannot actually do it. So this is a, a first 
experimental bias that we had identified and sort of, you know, ironed out a bit better in this work. Uh, it was already sort of, you know, noticed in a couple of uh, previous work that we uh, cited in, the, in, in our paper, of course. Um, but I believe that it was not really picked up too much by the community. And so and we hope that, you know, reiterating on the issues is, is what it takes to, to actually become more aware about the issue. So the second uh, ex source of experimental bias in the temporal domain, so here we'll, we'll talk about time, and temporal domain that we have identified is, is a little subtle. So it deals, we call it temporal goodware and malware inconsistency. Okay, so imagine again that you have, um, you know, your goodware and your malware, and the goodware are the space thingy, and the malware are these funny looking um, items there. And let's say that you train your classifier uh, using, so this is part of the training data set, and say that you train your classifier <coughs> using goodware from 2019. So it's up to you. So you have to collect uh, a data set that you want to train your classifier with. And again, so all these issues come because we're not really measuring and using data that comes from sensors, for instance, okay? They are representing all real life phenomena. So here is an object, and we are collecting this object, and we have to uh, represent them properly, and we have to come up now with an approach. And say that, you know, we were able to crawl Google Play in 2019, okay? That's fine. And then we collect malware, we collect goodware from 2019. Then uh, we have friends that could actually give us uh, uh, a good set of uh, a good data set of malware, but those come from all different timelines, so 2010, 2012, 2014. And we train the classifier with this data set. Okay, we have to train with goodware and malware, so we have to do both classes, of course. But the, the idea is actually one uh, class is very recent, and the other class is pretty old. Now, what is the problem here? Because I'm sure that you've seen settings like this in papers, where the data set is composed in a kind of, you know, a help way, and I'll tell you why we started asking ourselves all these questions, so um, just by serendipity, okay? <coughs> but what could be the problem here? <coughs> Because, so the problem is that you can have, so machine learning, we tend to see machine learning as you know, a magical toolbox, right? And it's not. I mean, it does magical things, but it is not, right? So all of that it takes, the, all of that, and, and it's, you know, if I, if I have to simplify or oversimplify it, the a machine learning algorithms try to find the best way to separate two classes, okay? So, and to that, it tries to find the best features that are important for the classification. Say that in 2019, you have a method that's called new method, okay? And this is only available to goodware because it didn't exist in 2020, 2012, 2014. As simple as that. Now, if that is part of your representation, okay, so if you use new method as a feature to represent uh, the presence or the absence of this method, of course, in the feature case, the classifier will actually weigh a lot the importance of this feature. So it will definitely separate the classes in goodware and malware, and everything will be fine as long as you have, as long as once you deploy the classifier, you feed malware that are from this timeline, 2012, 2010, 2012, 2014. Whenever you start seeing malware that belong to 2019, and assuming authors will also be using these new methods, and this is the most important feature that classifier relies on to take the decision. Well, all the samples will be misclassified because they will be treated as benign software because that is what the classifier is picking up. So the classifier is picking up an artifact. And the truth is that this is an oversimplification and you know a, a very clear example of how the issue is. But the truth is that in this task, we're not even sure whether the classifier actually solved the task that we want the classifier to solve. So to identify goodware and malware. We're not really sure. Most of the times, is not if not all the time, the classifier picks up artifacts 
that are not just representative of what we believe is good, being good wear or what we believe is malware. Truth said is that we don't even know sometimes what it is to be malicious. So if I send you a text message, is that a malicious action? I cannot say by its own whether it's a malicious action. There, there's a lot of context, contextualization we need to do to decide whether it's malicious action or not. It depends on you know, who I send this text message to. Is it somebody in my contact list? Is it somebody else a number I haven't seen? Does it happen in the background or does it happen after a user click on the button? And so forth and so on. So there are, it's not very simple, but if you just compose the data set in a similar way, then you're just introducing unwittingly an artifact. And it's very much likely a classifier will pick up that artifact. So again, we have to pay attention on how we compose the data set because otherwise we can learn artifact. This is not the only way that we may learn artifacts. So I just mentioned that in reality, we don't really know whether we're solving the tasks that we would like the classifier to solve, but at least we can try to avoid the common pitfalls. Okay. So then let's move on another um, experimental bias that we have identified, and this happened in this happens in the spatial domain. So the two one that we saw before are in the temporal domain. Yeah. This has to do with time on how you compose your data set to avoid artifacts, or whether you are interested in concept drift. So you're interested in understanding how the performance of the classifier would decay if it decays over time, assuming that IID doesn't hold anymore. Okay, so time domain. Um, here is, is a different consideration. And again, it's very dependent on the application domain you're considering. So if you have done network security or network injury detection systems, uh, or network anomaly detection systems and so forth and so on, you might have seen a bit less of this problem. But I'm sure that whenever you reason on malware classification tasks, and I ask you, okay, now collect this data set, assuming that your data set is fine, now you have to partition your data set and you do the things, uh, the correct things, uh, say that you do painful cross navigation, also another type of evaluation that I show you later on to consider time decay. But then the question is, okay, now in the testing data set, what is the ratio of goodware and malware that I should be considering, right? So I need to use a number, is it 50-50? So is it a balanced problem or is it imbalanced in its nature? What do you guys think? Is there a ratio that you can suggest that you use? Is that clear, the problem? So now I have my trading the testing data set, and I want to do binary classification. <coughs> so in the testing data set, I want to have goodware and malware because I want to know how good I am to detecting goodware and malware, basically. And if I have false positive, false negative, and so forth and so on. So I need to have a data set that is made by goodware object and malware object. So how many do I uh, introduce into the data set? I'm not talking about the quantity, let's say ratio. Let's talk, let's talk about class ratio. Do I introduce 50% of malware and 50% of the nine? Do I use 10% uh, of malware, 90% of the nine? Do I use 10% of the nine and 90% of malware? What is it, the number? Any guess? Yes? Would you want to make sure the ratio of the nine to malware is always more benign than malware to malware? Because that's usually what we find. So this is a very good observation. So, so the answer was that it, you, you should be using more malware, uh, sorry, more benign than malware because this is what you see in real life. Okay? So now, I don't know whether that's true in any application domain that you have, so, it's, it's, so people say that you know, we have, for instance, a lot more spam than ham, so than normal emails. So in that case, it will be twisted. It will be, you see a lot more malicious things than benign things. But in definitely, in, in a lot of domains, yes, we see a lot more benign things than malicious things. So just to give you a, a more generic answer is that it doesn't really matter what ratio you use, but it matters whether the ratio is realistic. The ratio is what you would expect to find in real life once you deploy the classifier. And this domain, it will be a specific ratio. In with the software domain, classification problem will be another ratio, maybe the same one. And the uh, classification of spam will be another ratio, maybe the same one as for so Yes? Can the ratio impact the procedure and record? Of course. That's my point. Okay. That's my point exactly. So <coughs> if you don't use, a tra so we need to use the right ratio. Because otherwise, first, we don't have a baseline to compare against. Because whenever you compare to another approach, and the ratio is different, then you can inflate results. So not only the results might be inflated, but also it doesn't give you a fair 
baseline because the settings of the experiments are different. As simple as that. Now, whether the other work is the right ratio or your work is the right ratio, it's only determined by the fact that whoever used the realistic ratio that you would find in real life. Now, this opens up again another open question that sometimes it's hard to identify what is the ratio. So in our work, we spoke with vendors and we, we, we read a couple of reports that we cited in the paper where basically we found out that roughly on average, so we averaged the, the, the results that were reported, 10% um, of malware, so sorry, in this, um, in, in Android, 10% um, of testing data sets should be malware and 90% should be goodware, okay? So there's a caveat whether this is actually the right uh, realistic distribution and that the best that we could do is just speak to vendors that operate in this uh, landscape and to read reports that have been put uh, in this landscape. We're not advocating 90-10 is correct. I mean, unless proven otherwise, 90-10 for us is the correct one. But if somebody then performs a, a longitudinal measurement study and says, you know, actually it's 80-20, that would be amazing, that would be amazing. It, it doesn't invalidate the methodology that I'm trying to outline here. It just, again, once more, um, puts emphasis on the need of having a realistic evaluation and a realistic class ratio in a data set. If you don't do it, so let's start to have a look at this, uh, at this plot here. So the train, let's forget for a second on the training data set, okay? Because also we had the same problem in the, in the, in the, of class ratio in the training data set. Okay? But let's forget because the concept of the implications are slightly different, and I'll tell you in a second what are the implications there. But let's focus on the testing data set. And here, <coughs> let's say that we vary the percentage of malware by downsampling goodware, in this case, because it's easier for us, okay? Because we have a data set and computational resources constraints. So here we have testing set ratio of goodware to malware. So <coughs> on the left hand side, on your left hand side, you have 100 to 1. So 100. Uh, mal good, sorry, 100 goodware and one malware. And then you move to the middle where you have 50% of each class, and then you move on the other side where you have uh, one goodware <coughs> per 100 malware, okay? So completely opposite. Okay, now let's assume that the recall is this line here, okay? I'm just <coughs> making this up. Let's assume that the recall is this line here, and it doesn't change over time, okay? It doesn't change over time regardless of whether you you change the ratio of goodware and malware, okay? Uh, in this context, positive is malware, so true positive is a malware that is recognized as a malware, that is classified as a malware. And false negative is, so negative is, uh, is, um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a goodware, but false negative is a goodware that hasn't been classified. So, if you have a classifier that is very good at detecting malware. Let's assume that you know you build a classifier, and the classifier is just very good at detecting malware. So it's very, it has a very high true positive rate. Now, the problem is that it might be not so good in dealing with goodware. So it is good at detecting malware. So of course, you know, it's always a, a matter of a trade-off because you can have a classifier that always predict malware. 100%, it's a good classifier. But at the same time, it's 100% of false positive. So, of course, you cannot use it. So, let's say that you have a classifier that works very well and is able to detect malware. But at the same time, it's a bit fragile on the false positives. So, on uh, goodware that are misclassified as malware. So, positive is malware. If you have a goodware that's a negative class, uh, that is classified as a malware, that is a, not a positive, is a false positive, okay? What happens is that you can just really boost up the precision of the classifier because in the training data set now, you just add a lot more malware than goodware. Precision depends on two positives, and true positives. Now, true positives are fine because we said that we have a classifier that is good in that. So that number wouldn't change. The true positive. Okay. What can affect the precision is an increase of false positives. But now, if I keep on removing from my data set goodware, there is.
there's a less chance of causing an error. So there's a less chance that the, the good word that I have remaining inflate that value of precision too much. So and as an end result, I have far fewer false positives, and therefore, that number is compared to before, where I had a lot more false positive here, because I had a lot more good word, but I cannot deal with good word very well. So false positive <coughs> is very high, and precision is very low. <coughs> as I keep on removing from the class ratio good word from the testing data set, well, I, the classifier makes fewer mistakes. And then you report a higher precision. And of course, you know, combined with the recall, then you have an harmonized mean of the F1 score. Again, pick the line that you like in your work. So, this is just to show you that it's a very simple, simple consideration on the data set changes the result from being realistic and truthful to have something completely inflated. Now, I'm not advocating, I'm not saying that people have done this on purpose, okay? But of course, you know, this is what happens. And this is just to answer your question. Of course, yes, you, you inflate. And I've shown this just on false positive, but you can do different reasoning on recall as well. Um, as I mentioned, in our case, this is the bar where, where we believe we should be working with, and it's motivated in the paper. We consider that to be uniformly distributed across the time frame. Of course, this is an assumption, it might change, so it could, the distribution, the clustering might vary across time. Not only how clever the idea you have <coughs> is to solve the problem, but if you have an experiment that doesn't fit with the theory, well, you have to go back. So either you've done the experiment wrong, but if you try to do it right, and you see that there's a very poor performance, that's okay, well, then my theory doesn't really work very well. <coughs> and if we all agree to this, then also this gives us a chance to have a fair comparison against other baseline. Because if we, at that point, we have no <coughs> variables to play with. We don't have a class ratio to play with, and different results that we end up with. At that point, we have a fair comparison that we can have with other approaches. So we try to, once we identified all these experimental bias, we try to present a framework that we call Tesseract that enforces uh, uh, experimental constraints in the temporal and the spatial domain towards a fair and sound methodology of evaluation for machine learning um, uh, machine learning algorithm in security context when you care also about concept rate. So where you believe the, the domain that you're working with uh, is non-stationary and then therefore, you might be affected by concept rate, okay? So we have a framework that does it. And what we have developed is, uh, it's just, you know, a methodology that you can apply to your approach uh, to enforce <coughs> evaluation constraint and remove these source of bias, okay? In the temporal domain and in the spatial domain. So the first one is, we call C1. It's just the one that, that requires that the timestamp of the training object should come before of the timestamp of the testing object. Because otherwise, you're sort of cheating, because you're using knowledge in the future to, to evaluate your classifier. Now, in the case for cross validation, this still happens, but that's fine, and you have still to do a case for cross validation, because that is represented in that whole time frame of the performance of the classifier in the absence of concept. The second one is what I mentioned before, is that you have to be careful and you have to be sure that once you use a class ratio, once you use, sorry, two classes or whatever classes you use in your training data set, that they are drawn from the same time state. <coughs> so you cannot use goodware from 2019 and malware from 2020, 2010 or vice versa, because the risk is that you, you have very easily, there is an artifact that the classifier would pick on that. So just to avoid this source of bias, you may have many others that we have not looked at but at least you have to enforce this constraint so that you are sure that you don't have this sort of you know, easy to identify bias. And then the third one is just you have to have a realistic class ratio in the testing data set. Because if you don't, not only you cannot really compare against a baseline or against a, a state of the art, but the result that you have might be inflated. It might be not, because by chance you have a right uh, class ratio. But otherwise, the result that it might be inflated. And results of previous work might have actually been inflated, and this is what we found in our study as well. Now, sorry, before going there, uh, I wanted to mention, so I didn't say anything about uh, the clustering in the training data set, right? So I only mentioned the clustering <coughs> in, the, in the testing data set. Of course, you know, we have to do a similar reasoning in the training data set. Is that a problem? 
So should we enforce a, a, a realistic uh, class ratio in the training data set as well? Or there is a bit of a leeway there. That's a 50, right? That would make it easier, things easier. Now, if you change things in the training data set, so the question is, can you change the class ratio in the training data set? So we believe that you can. Because changing the class ratio in the training data set affect the optimization of the algorithm. So affect the training of the algorithm. You're just making the algorithm more sensitive or less sensitive towards one class or the other. So you do affect it, <coughs> but as long as you play with it and you know what you're affecting, that is a fair game. So we have, I don't believe I have time not to do it here, but we have in the paper what we call uh, a tuning algorithm that empirically plays with this and it returns the best class ratio for that specific algorithm with that specific feature space, so that specific abstraction of that problem space that you're considering, uh, to actually improve a little bit the performance of the classifier over time, so in the present cost of it, without, without changing the approach at all. So we just make the classifier a little bit more sensitive towards one class or the other, depending on the problem. And we have this empirical algorithm that finds the right sweet spot. So, but basically the point that I wanted to make is that it's a fair game to do it in the training. You have to understand what does this entail. It entails that you are making the classifier more sensitive or not towards one class. And therefore, if you make it too much towards one class, of course, you know, you become very good at defending the class, but then you have a bunch of issues with the other. So you have to be very careful, of course. And the empirical algorithm is just something that, that can it make sense to use multiple classifier with different training set ratio between Google and Marvel and take, let's say, the average of the results? Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't tried, so I don't know what, what the implication might have been on that. I have the, the sensation that if you have that one classifier, per, let's say, uh, classify better good work and another one classify better malware if you split training sets 70% and 30% another one 70% of malware and 30% and another one 50 and see you take the average of yes. the three you take the average of the okay. three for so, okay, example but, but of the ten or of the 100 kind of, classified yeah, but this is kind of an, an ensemble approach so so of course yes if you, if you work as a, an ensemble approach you can do this and this is what you will do so I'm not sure whether this works well in this specific domain. Um, but of course, you know, ensembles of people have shown that they are more successful than just a single classifier sometimes. Sure. Just to show you that this is not an isolated problem, so we wanted to go back to uh, a bit of papers that were published uh, over the years. So we started from 2009 up until 2018. And... Uh, we sampled papers that were applying machine learning uh, in a security context. That most of them are well, they're not necessarily Android model classification or model classification in general. So some of them deal with JavaScript classification, others deal with uh, PDF classification. So we tried to sort of use an icon here to remind what is the target of the application domain. And the C1, C2, C3 represent the constraints that we have identified in the temporal domain and in a spatial domain. <coughs> And a red dot means that that paper violated those constraints, okay? So as you can see, and papers, we sample paper, but uh, you know, if you can see using security, NDSS, SMP, uh, CCS, RAID, uh, dot, 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 AXAC, NSDI, uh, Journal Machine Learning Research, is a top journal in the, in the community. Our point not, was not to point the finger uh, against people that have done it wrongly, because we are guilty as charged as well. So it's just an awareness of the implications and the assumptions that we have in our field. Okay? So, and now I just want to highlight one paper here. Um, uh, this was uh, 2014 NDSS, so Drabin. And Drabin violated C1 and C2 in the sense that it only reported k form cross validation results, so holdout validation results. So in the, uh, assuming the absence of constant drift, that's a good evaluation, okay? <coughs> but the split that the paper used was the right class ratio in the testing data set, okay? So 
I would say that it is a good paper. It doesn't evaluate the calcifier in the presence of calcifer, so how quickly does it decay? But that's fine. So all the rest is pretty all right. There is another <coughs> paper that was published in NDSS 2017. That I believe that that was the paper that sort of started us on this work that I just mentioned. So I told you that we haven't set out to carry out this research in the first place. And it was more like a serendipity. So we had an idea, and we wanted we were working on Android model classification. And we came up with some abstraction we wanted to use. And at that time, there was this paper, it's called MAM Android, NDSS 2017, that was basically the state of the art of, uh, of, the, uh, of the moment. And we wanted to basically replicate the result uh, of this approach because we wanted to compare against the state of the art. And if you look at the paper, the paper has gazillions of different experimental settings. So different class ratio, different uh, algorithm, not the same algorithm, but different class ratio with different time frames. So, five minutes, okay. So I'll try to really skip it a lot. Uh, but basically, um, the problem is that there were far too many. How many of you will have to go at three? I guess most of you. No, not very many. Because, I mean, I was worried that people might have lectures Okay. Then, uh, shop, but if most of people say it, you go a few minutes longer. I'll go a few minutes longer, yes, and then, and then we'll see. We'll see. I'll stay here in the afternoon. Apologies anyway. to those who have to go. Yes, you're welcome. So, so um, basically, uh, there were far too many experimental uh, settings, and uh, it was not clear what, which one was the right one. And then we started looking at the problem, and then we identified all these issues that I've just referred to you guys. So, um, to be able to actually prove with experiments what our claims, because of course this was all the reasoning, we looked at the papers and then we found all the issues. we wanted to sort of you know, show with experiments what, what was the issue and whether the issues could be measured somehow. So to do this, we had to have access to a large and representative data set with timestamps, which was this is what we need to do the time aware evaluation. And we had to have access to the reproducible 